So God's been doing some stuff in my life over the last ever. Uh, so he's been, he's been doing my life, but especially over the last couple of years, but especially the last six months. All right, and then especially the last week. And so I just want to kind of bring you up on that, all right? So, so, so a lot of this stuff I'm going to tell you, you're going to go, oh, you already talked about this last month or six months ago or something like that. But some of you come to church every once in a while. You know who you are. So I'm going to explain it all again, okay? So here it goes. This past January, uh, me, and some, me and some other, uh, other guys here, on, we got on a plane and we visited all of our international partners all over the world. We went to Afghanistan, we went to Africa, then we ended up in Mexico City, and then we came home in 12 days. It was crazy, all right? But as I was in all these countries, I kept having the same conversation over and over about what I was seeing God doing in my own heart and the hearts of men and husbands and fathers all over the world. Like not, not just here in Denver, not just at Flatirons, all, all over the planet, right? And it goes like this. It's like a movement of God calling men to get back in the fight, to become the men that we were meant and created to be that reflects the true masculine image of God that is pressed into every man who's ever been born. But, but somewhere, somehow over the years, over the last decades or whatever, manhood, masculinity has been dumbed down, castrated, tamed down, domesticated. We have a lot of very, 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 wimpy men. We just do. Anyway, so I'm down in Mexico City, and I met a missionary. His name's James Henderson, and we connected. It was just crazy. It's just like, dude, you complete me. Not in a weird way, but you know what I mean. All right, so, <laughs> so it's like we were really connected, and it's like we just started talking and finishing each other's sentences, and it's like I finally found someone who really shared the same heart for what, for what God was doing in my life and teaching me about masculinity and manhood and being a leader and being a father and all that kind of stuff. And we just went on. We just spent a half a day together down there. But before I got on a plane, James didn't know me very well. So he said, here's some books. I want you to read them. <sighs> Which I did. All right. I, 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 most of them. All right. And I, so I took him home. And then off we went. So we started emailing and texting and calling back and forth. Colorado to Mexico City. And God started doing something in my heart. And I shared some of this way back, back in February, March, something like that. All right. I knew that during that I Am That Man series. Before I walk up these six steps and turn around and teach anybody anything, but especially men about what God might want to do in their lives, as husbands, as men, as fathers, as sons, I had to go first. Remember I talked about this. I, I have to go first. If I'm going to lead this way, i gotta, I got to go first. So that was kind of phase one. Then a few weeks ago, my son Jordan and I, and I told you about this too, we got my Jeep, we drove down to Texas, and we met James. He flew up from Mexico City. We went to his dad's farm, and we went pig hunting, all right? And while we were there, we talked some more. And by this time, James is checking out flat irons. He didn't know much about us, all right? So he's trying to put flat irons in a category. He never met anybody like me. He tried to put me in a category. I don't fit. All right, I don't, I, I just said, but he tried, he did, he did his best. Because th for some of you, this is the only church you've ever been to. You think this is the way it always is. This is not, this is not normal, all right? You gotta understand, this is not normal. It's weird in a good way. But anyway, so, but he's from West Texas. And it doesn't happen there, all right? So anyway, so some of you from Texas going, that's what, sure, all right? So, all right, so, so James gave me some more stuff. And again, I kept doing it, kept, kept reading, kept re reading. So a few days after I got back, and again, some of you know this, all right? I got back from Texas. I sat down at my dining room table. And I did something I'd never done before and haven't done since, so don't get excited, all right? I journaled. I'm not a journaler. I'm not that guy, all right? But I sat down at my dining room table and I just started vomiting out everything. Everything I was feeling, everything I was thinking about, all my thoughts, all my feelings. I wrote down stuff that I'd never written down before. I, I, I said things. I actually wrote this down. I've never seen that in print before. Things that I'd done. Things, things, things that, that had been done to me. S stuff that nobody in the, on the planet knows about. Robin knows some of it at that point. Now she knows all of it. But at that point, nobody knew all of it. But I wrote it all down. Then, then I, I, I call her IT person. I pass her protected and had him killed. Because nobody can see this. This is crazy <laughs> stuff, all right, right? So a couple days later, and I felt good about it. I felt, there it is. You know, it's kind of cathartic that I did that. So a couple days later, I told James. I was on the phone with James in Mexico City. I said, hey, this is what I, done, I, I did. And his response was, Jim, that is awesome. Can I read it? <laughs> and I said, well, let me pray about it. And what I meant was, let me erase that part and take that paragraph out, and then I'll send it to you, maybe, all right? So, so it's kind of an oh, crap moment. So eventually, though, I sent it. But about four or five days later, I sent it. It's like, and I, I really wrestled. Finally, I hit the send button. It's like, uh, all right. And what I got back from him was grace. Grace, Jim, that's awesome. Total encouragement. Then he said this. This is the new part that you guys don't know about. Then he said, hey, Jim, I want you to really consider going on this men's retreat called the Crucible Project. I've been on staff with it for several years. It changed my life. I think you ought to go on it. And I said, that, that's interesting. Tell me about it. And what I meant was, tell me about it, but I'm not going to go. I, I lead retreats. I don't go on retreats. That's who I am. All right, so, all right, so I don't want to. Can you tell me about this, this retreat? And he says, I can't tell you about the retreat. I'm like, you want me to go on a retreat, but you won't tell me what it's about? He says, well, I can't because it's, it's kind of like Fight Club. <laughs> I'm like, well, I dig that. But, it, but the number one rule of, of Fight Club is don't talk about Fight Club. Thank you. Go to the movies more, folks. All right, so, all right. <laughs> so, so the normal, you can't talk about it, right? But he said, but trust me. And at that point, I did trust him. He says, what you're going through at this point in your life and what you wrote down and what you sent to me is perfect. And I told him I'd think about it. I didn't, I didn't really mean that. I thought I'd pray about it and tell him no because I don't, do, don't want to go on that. But I did it. 
So a couple days later, I, I ta I'm talking to him on the phone, and I say, hey, James, I did it. I signed up. I found a crucible. They're all over the country, all right? And you can get online and find out more about it. But I found one of the retreats. It's in the middle of nowhere. Nowhere. It's West Texas. It's in the middle of nothing, all right? And I'm going to go by myself. No one I know is going to be there. I can just be myself. I don't have to be Pastor Jim. I can just be me. And he says, that's great, but you really need to take somebody with you. That defeats the purpose. So I thought, crap, all right? So I thought, who can I take that I trust? So I invited Dan, my best friend Dan, and I said, will you go on this retreat? What's it about? I don't know. It's like Fight Club. I don't know. I don't know. He said, I would love to, but I can't because I'm leading a trip to Afghanistan at the same time. I went, okay. So I called Michael, one of our elders, one of my really, really good friends. He said, yes. Now, what is it? I went, I don't know. It's like Fight Club. And he said, I'll go anyway. Then a couple weeks later, Dan comes back to me and goes, okay, listen, God's doing something in your life. God's doing something in our church. I'm the men's pastor here. I told Afghanistan that I'm not coming on this trip. I'm going with you. So now there's three of us going on the retreat, all right? It's not anonymity anymore. It's a carpool, all right? So we're going, <laughs> we're going to Texas. And it gets worse. It gets worse, all right? So then Chris Moser, the real tall guy that we just hired and, and on our worship team, plays keyboards amazingly, all right? He's been a member of those staffs, these crucible staffs, all over the world for the last 10 years. About three weeks ago, he walks down the hallway to my office and goes, hey, guess what? I'm leading your retreat. <laughs> this time, folks, I didn't say, oh, crap. I said something else, all right? <laughs> Out loud in the hallway, all right? So pray for me, all right, right? And then he said, can we eat lunch? I'm like, yeah. So we went up to BW3s later that day, and he says, listen, I, I lead these retreats, but I've never led anybody like you. Thank you? Uh, I didn't know. <laughs> I said, what do you mean? He says, well, so you're a strong leader, and I'm afraid that, that you, and you're my leader, you're my boss, all right? I'm afraid if you're in the room, I will back off, and I won't bring my A game. And I said, well, then you, you don't, don't lead the retreat. Either you need to find a different retreat, or I need to find another retreat, because God's doing something in my life, and if you back off and don't bring your A game, I lose. So one of us needs to change. And he says, I got this, I got this. And several times through the retreat, he finally said, are you okay with me being here? Are you okay with, being with me being here? Finally, I looked back at me, Chris, are you okay with what I'm about to say? Because if you can't handle it, then go get in your car. He said, I got this, I got this. So this past weekend, this is why I wasn't here last week, I took two close friends, Dan and, and Michael, and I went to West Texas to this, to this men's retreat, all right? And it, it, this is how I said it to Rob when I got back last Sunday night. And she says, well, how was it? And I said this, I learned some stuff about myself that she already knew was true. I just didn't believe it. Here's what God taught me last week. And I'm not going to give you all the details of Crucible Retreat. You can get online. But I can't tell you about it because the number one rule of Fight Club is don't talk about it. But, and I'm not going to tell you all the details of my own life. I'm not going to confess my sins to you all. I'm not going to tell you what the thorn is in my flesh that I've struggled with. Because here's what will happen. If I do that, you'll reduce this whole talk down to that. Well, he's not talking about me. But we can all fill in the blank. We can all fill in the blank with whatever crap that we're going through. The other thing is I'm not going to stand up here and confess other people's sins to you all when I've never confronted them personally, at least not yet. So let me simply say this, and this is where it ties into everything I've been talking about on a bigger church-wide level, about Christians should or shouldn't, and a level of, of grace that we need to extend, and who gets grace and who doesn't get grace. This is my story. See, I have some stuff in my life. I know you do too, but I have some stuff in my past, and I thought I was over it, but it won't stay in the past. And it raises its head every day, and I've done some stuff in my life. I'm ashamed of what I've done. I've had some stuff done to me, and I hate what was done to me. But I've relived it every day for years. Not This isn't a week thing. This is decades. I've relived it every day of my life. I hear a voice in my head every day that tells me that I'm not enough, that I'm not a good man. I don't deserve to have Robin as, as my wife or have these children as my kids. And every day I'm told by this voice in my head, you shouldn't be leading this church. You're not qualified. Every day, based on this voice and these memories in my head, I feel like everything I have is conditional. And if I screw up or just screw up one more time, I will lose everything. Everything is conditional. Don't mess up. Don't mess up. And here's the thing is, I know that's not true. If you come to me in the lobby and go, Jim, you know that's not true. I know. I, can, I, I know Bible verses that say everything that I'm feeling is different. I can stand up here and teach you all that what I'm feeling is not biblical. But here's the, the reality. I can't stop. I can't shake it. For decades, every day, every day it comes back. Every communion service I've ever participated where I take that little cup and that little piece of bread, this is what I think about. Every day, it won't go away. Jim, you're a fake. You're not enough. You're not a good enough man. You're not really only a man. Fear, shame, insecurity. Now, let me tell you my theology. I believe that God has forgiven me for my past based on what Jesus did on the cross for me. I believe if I die tonight, I will go to heaven. I'm not even afraid to die. I believe the Holy Spirit lives in me and has for years. I believe that God has given me grace. My problem is I won't give myself any. I won't, I won't give myself any grace. I won't forgive myself. I discovered that I've been holding myself and the things that I did wrong and didn't do wrong, right as a kid. I've been holding myself as a child to a 52-year-old level of accountability, and it's not fair. It's not fair what we do to ourselves. And so here's what I did last week. 
All right? And you've got to work through this if you don't fully understand it. But here's what I did. I didn't have a conversation with God. You know why? God and I are fine. We're fine. I didn't ask God for anything except strength and courage to not turn back from the truth that I knew I had to walk through this fire. I did have a conversation. I had a conversation with myself. I went back to a time, a day, a moment, a place in my life that every, time, every day for the last decades when I close my eyes, I'm back there again and I look in my own eyes as a little kid and my conversation with myself went like this. You just did the best you could. You did the best you could. You didn't know what else to do, so you did the only thing that you could. And looking back, ah, you know, as a 52-year-old, I looking back, I wish I'd done it different. If I had this information, I might have lived my life different, but I didn't. I did the best I could, but I didn't know what to do. I was just trying to survive. And in that moment in West Texas, a week ago, after decades of guilt and shame and insecurity, the things that have capped and ruined huge sections of my life, I decided to let myself off the map, and I gave myself some grace, and I heard a voice it wasn't God's voice. I, I'd heard God's voice. I know what he had to say. I needed to hear my own voice. I heard my own voice say this with confidence, not arrogance, but with confidence. I told myself, finally, I am a man, and I'm a good one, and I'm supposed to be Robin's husband, and I'm supposed to be my kid's father, and I am supposed to lead this church because I'm a good man because God made me good. God did I'll just, I'll just push on this, right? As a matter of fact, my greatest aha moment was this. There have been times in my life, and I know I'm going to see the heads nodding here, right? There have been times in my life where I have wrestled with God, and I told him he's not a good God, that he doesn't do his job very well. He doesn't take very good care of me. I put my finger in God's chest and said, you should have done my life differently. And here's the life realization, life-changing realization. I, 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 I discovered this. If all of the pain and all the shame and all the tears and all the whatever that you don't need to know about of my past, if that's the only way to get to this moment so I can have Robin as my wife and have these kids and these grandkids, I have two and one more on the way, and to, to be in this church and to lead this church, you know what? I would do it again. Do it to me again. Hurt me again. Sign me up again because God, God was there the whole time. Listen, God was there. Looking back, he was there the whole time. I just didn't see him. I couldn't hear him because of the pain in my life. But he was there and he was always good. I told him he was a bad God. I was wrong. He was good. And he used and is using everything in my life. Nothing is wasted. God has already given me grace. I finally decided to let myself off the mat and give myself some grace. Does anybody else need to do that? Yeah. yeah. See, I finally decided it's time. See, if God is so faithful and so willing and ready to forgive us and open his arms to us, why is it so hard for us to do that to ourselves? Listen, I'll just, I'm going to let you off the mat. Let yourself off the mat. You did the best you could. You tried. You tried. It didn't work. The marriage fell apart. The kids, whatever that is, you got held down. Whatever that is, you did the best you could to survive the moment. And for years, it has dis defined you. And because you thought, that's who or that's what or that's all I am and all I'm ever going to be. It's not true. It doesn't have to be true, at least not anymore. God's forgiven you, and God has given you grace. You did the best you could. Isn't it time for you to give yourself a little grace? It's time. This is a horrible way to live. It's exhausting, isn't it? Back to the theme. Fire, fire can be a good thing or a bad thing. Here's what I know about fire. In order for something new to come and grow, something else has to go. And by go, I mean it has to be burned to the ground for something new. And I know it's hard to say, I'm going to walk into the fire. But if you don't, if you don't, if you turn away because you're afraid of the fire, this is your life. It's all it's ever going to be. And I want to get better. A few weeks ago, I was at the military event, and, uh, and, and a guy gave me a book. I'm an adult. I'm reading books. Look at that. And uh, it's a cool book. It's called The Warrior Ethos. It's the story of Alexander the Great. I, I love his story. He conquered the whole known world by the time he was 33. But there was this one story in here about he was facing an overwhelming battle. And no matter, they, they'd conquered every army they'd come across. This time it was a bigger army, something they'd never faced before. And his men were afraid. And so Alexander walked in front of his whole army, stripped down naked, turned 360 degrees. And he said, you see my scars? You see my scars? They're all on the front of my body. There's no scars on my back. Why? Because I won't quit. The only way you get scars on your back is if you're running away, and I'm not going to run away. I will lead you. I, I, won't, I won't turn back. I'll go first. And he led the charge, and they took the battle. Now, here's why I tell you that. I'm not Alexander the Great, and, and I ain't getting naked. So there, there you go, all right? So <laughs> thank you, all right? <laughs> oh, good. I didn't know where this sermon was going. What kind of church? You know, so. Here's what, and I'm not being arrogant, I'm not. I can say this confidently because of Jesus. Because of the healing and empowering grace of Jesus, I'm a man, and I'm a good one, and I'm going to lead my wife, I'm going to lead my family, and a few other men, I'm going to lead this church. So, 
Church, I'll go first, and I promise I won't quit on you, and I won't turn back. Sovereign God has trusted me with a little piece of his kingdom called Flatirons, but more importantly, my family. And because of grace, I'm letting go of the past. I did the best I could. I screwed some parts up. I've been forgiven. I've forgiven myself. I'm pressing on, and I'm not turning back. The message is or could be true for you. And it's probably why God drug your butt in here today to hear it for yourself. Through Jesus, God has forgiven you. It is time to forgive yourself and live a better life.